Hello, it's an image of Mark Edward Ochterman coming at you and for me it is the 10th of May 2020 still under our COVID quarantine and so it's an opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, developing syllabi so that they can uh, be direct directives for a course and using the example of an introductory course to philosophy and I ended up the last uh, segment talking about <clears throat> digressing a bit about course content and the course content that I had used um, when I first began teaching Introduction to Philosophy and upon review of that um, I noticed a few things that uh, that could bear some correction. Um, one is that when I first began introducing um, Indian material, that is to say material from India, into the course um, the first text that I used was not the Bhagavad Gita, which is considered to be an Upanishad, but um, a book of Upanishads. Um, uh, and it almost seems to me that I started out using Juan Mascaro's translation because it seems to me that at a very early iteration of, uh, of that course at Lebanon Valley College, I was also using the Protagoras and Menno uh, in the Penguin, Penguin Classics as part of that class. Um, I presume because I wanted to look at the Protagoras um, because I think that we also used Grube's translation of five dialogues by Plato, but <clears throat> that's that that's now far too detailed um, for this uh, stage of things, and you know we'll see whether this survives in editing. But uh, I concluded the the first section by talking about some titles uh, which I don't believe that I ever taught a course in philosophy that used either foundations of philosophy or fundamentals of philosophy as a name for the course, but uh, when I was um, reaching the end of my time at the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, um, I was working with several people there, especially the registrar, um, to refine the course catalog and, and the overall curriculum of the Department of Liberal Arts. And um, there was a way in which we, we kept finding uh, course after course after course after course would be introduction to this and introduction to that and to break up the verbal monotony of the of the catalog and also to sort of change the focus a little bit from this is an introductory course even though people are taking it who are juniors and seniors um, to cast the the notion in a, in a little bit different way, uh, at least verbally in the catalog, changing to foundations of or fundamentals of X, you know, whatever it was. <clears throat> now, had I taught a course that was called Foundations of Philosophy, um, for me, at any rate, that would be suggestive of something quite different from, uh, or uh, quite different to, for those of you who like to say it that way, um, 
a problems of philosophy course. To me, problems of philosophy or issues of philosophy suggest a more limited special topics kind of thing that would be within the context of a philosophy department and probably something where it would be in a sense selected topics or selected issues, selected problems from philosophy uh, for seniors, say, you know, kind of senior seminar type thing. And maybe in the in an actual iteration, um, so in the course catalog it might appear as problems of philosophy, but in the actual practice of the course, you know, confronted with actual human beings taking this course, um, we might call it, rather than problems of philosophy, we might look at some kind of specific problems of philosophy, like uh, um, uh, well, at Lebanon Valley College, after I was uh, not working at the main campus anymore, but working at the uh, at the Lancaster Center, a number of my colleagues there had a course that they called the Love Course, which was basically a problems in philosophy relating to the general topic of love. Um, you know, which would be a fine course. Um, you know, you could have the Virtue Course or the Being Course or any number of different. Uh, uh, different uh, iterations of, of that, of uh, problems of philosophy. But when you say foundations of philosophy or fundamentals of philosophy, um, that th those both seem far more summative. So um, all of this is really just to say that the title does count for something, and the title should be thought out. And if you are working from a college catalog that, or yeah, a catalog uh, that has a specific description of the course, and the course title is Introduction to Philosophy, why then that's what you should call it too. And if you wish to alter it very much, you should definitely, um, you know, be in communication with uh, whatever kind of um, administrative structure there is in the institution where you work um, to ensure that it, the, the course as you construct it is meeting the goals for that course of the institution at large. So um, there, there should not be a great deal of disparity between the boots on the ground version of the course and the, you know, what's in the catalog version of the course in terms of what it does for the students in their um, uh, ability to transfer credit um, or to demonstrate their learning. So, all of those are. Uh, important prefatory kinds of, uh, of matters that uh, really should, there, there should be some, some weighty thought, I think, behind uh, the title of the course. And possibly even to the point of how the course is numbered or how it's described. So, is it PHL or PHIL uh, 100, 101, 102, 105? Uh, you know, what kind of significance may there be to some of those things? So, I have worked in institutions where there's philosophy 100, which is logic, and then philosophy 101, which is introduction to logic, and then philosophy 102 and 103, which are uh, history of Philosophy 1 and History of Philosophy 2, and possibly those four courses uh, can be construed in some degree to be interchangeable in terms of 
necessary student learning, not in terms of um, uh, the, their, their progress through a major uh, or a minor, but uh, through their general education component. So, again, that's another thing that, that really needs to be considered in establishing um, a syllabus that uh, if the course is one, and introduction to philosophy courses are very frequently, I, I wouldn't say always, but um, they are very frequently part of a general education um, component, and that needs to be not only considered, but um, really made somewhat explicit within the context of the syllabus. So, uh, that's a bit about titles. The next thing really is the, the course description, um, which in my view should be pretty broad. Um, it should not uh, get down to specifics of what students will learn in the course uh, uh, in respect to um, oh well, you know, particulars. Uh, it should be more general. Uh, but it should give a notion as to whether this is really going to be construed as primarily a, uh, a, a sort of literary critical course uh, like great books uh, view of philosophy, whether it's going to be primarily historical, topical, following uh, the, the breakdown uh, that I considered last time, um, but also uh, whether it's really designed to be a critical thinking course uh, as opposed to something else, and just exactly what that is going to mean. Uh, and again, the course description is really a good place um, to, to, to mention, at any rate, that the course is a general education course if it is, in fact, a general education course. So, um, as a rule, the course description given in a course catalog is adequate for a syllabus um, and it is also generally quite general and uh, also often brief. All of which is fine and uh, you may not wish to mess with that at all but it should certainly be part of a syllabus. So typically you know at the beginning of a syllabus there is the name of the course, the number of the course of PHL 100 Introduction to Philosophy as an example or whatever yours happens to be. And then typically that's followed by uh, things like what semester this is, you know, just in case people have forgotten, or also uh, if in, in my opinion, a, a teacher and instructor who is really striving to improve her or his performance through time is very likely to change up the syllabus. And so, um, you know, it, it should not just be a boilerplate. Uh, this is philosophy one, 100, and it is the same syllabus that I've been using you know, since 1972, here it is, you know, nothing has changed in terms of my teaching, nothing has changed in terms of the field of philosophy or how we think about this material or what students are like or anything like that, you know, just here it is and th then it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's spring or, uh, you know, a summer intensive term or a winter intensive term or fall or, you know, it just doesn't matter. but. For most of us, uh, we are hoping to see some improvement in our performance. We're hoping to see some change through time. And also just to help people out to know what roughly, you know, within 15 weeks uh, 
what year it is and that sort of thing. So you spring 1985, you know, I'm still living in the past, uh, you know, what, whatever that happens to be. And then um, the times of the class, the place where the class takes place. Uh, of course, in these days of virtual classes, uh, you know, you'll need to change that up a little bit. And I haven't given a whole lot of thought to it, quite frankly, um, because uh, virtual syllabi that are fed into a system, you know, desire to learn or Blackboard or whatever it happens to be, are going to be um, uh, are going to be subject to the conditions of that that medium. I'm talking about a physical syllabus that you would hand out in a traditional face-to-face -face course. And maybe I should have said that right at the beginning. Uh, hopefully, catch that in the editing later on. But um, the uh, the other information that I typically would put before the course description would include my name, that is to say the name of the instructor, um, uh, where my office is, um, presuming that I have one, um, uh, what my office hours are, um, any uh, telephone number of the office, uh, my my best contact email. Um, opinions vary and you should be speaking with people at your institution um, that you know and trust or that are administrators. Or the, the two groups need not be mutually exclusive um, that uh, can, can tell you whether or not to include, for example, a personal mobile phone number. Um, some people think that that is very important and a fine thing and they don't mind any security risk that that may pose. Um, some institutions will absolutely forbid that and you have to go through, you know, a departmental secretary or a divisional secretary or something like that uh, if you're not using, um, you know, the, an, an office phone or an office contact they will want you to use your um, institutional email, not a Gmail or Hotmail or uh, whatever archaic uh, form of um, electronic communication that you may use. So uh, those address type things, um, times, dates, and so on, they should definitely appear on a syllabus. And I say this, and I, I think that probably a lot of you who are watching this um, are saying, well, thanks, but no thanks, because you're not really giving me any information that I didn't already have. These are things that really um, uh, are, are actually worth some reflection as to uh, the details of them and how you want to present them and, uh, of course, you want to follow whatever is the system that your institution has or uh, if you're so placed as to be able to configure them completely on your own, uh, then you should really consider, you know, uh, where does my name go in all of this? You know, do I put it first? Do I put it last? How do I, you know, how do I address those kinds of things? And where you place it will suggest different um, different types of relationships between the course and you and every, everybody else. So um, uh, I don't know that there's a single way to do it, but that is information that typically comes before the course description. Uh, and I usually leave a bit of space. I don't usually have a whole lot of space in my in my syllabus, but that's a place where I usually do leave a bit of a gap. Um, just f for a visual break, I guess, because usually uh, all that uh, detail of where the course is and when it is and when the office hours are and all that kind of thing, 
make a, a pretty uh, a pretty solid block that's uh, visually you know kind of numbing so then I leave some space and then I have uh, sometimes even the title of the course again or you know it, it actually is appearing uh, for the first time down below and then course description usually I spell out what each section of the syllabus is so course description there it is uh, and it became a standard practice for me to include the course description as it appeared in the course catalog and then to offer an expansion of that from my own experience the way that I did the course to give it um, an individual quality um, and also to make abundantly clear that this was uh, as it generally was for me a great books course or in those instances fairly few where I taught um, intro to philosophy uh, with some other type of format than having a, a group of six or eight or so uh, great books um, but instead I used textbooks which were perfectly fine and in their own way might be said to be great but you know were were either extracts or uh, some kind of summary uh, summary narrative like um, uh, Douglas Socio's Archetypes of Wisdom, which I also sometimes used together with great books, which was a bit of overload. Uh, but it, it, Socio gave an overview for those people who wanted it, and then the great books, uh, you know, were, were giving the main content from which I worked in the class. Uh, and I've also taught these courses with just Douglas Socho's book, and I've also used a few other um, introductory texts that are either um, editions of extracts from works, you know, so you know, certain chunks of um, The Republic, and then chunks of the Nicomachean, event. not the whole thing, but, you know, portions of, and then portions of Thomas Aquinas, etc., 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 right, you know, on through to, I don't know how, where, where they got to, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we got up to Wittgenstein. Um, and, uh, I, just, for some people, that's a, that's a method that works really well. I, for me, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable with the with the extracts that end up in those works and I kind of think well you know like I'm just not comfortable with extracts I, I tend to want to take works as entireties and um, consider you know why do we have this uh, digression about this slave in in the meno uh, why do we have Anatus kind of, you know, snarkily um, uh, throwing his, uh, his comments out at the end of, of the meno. Um, you know, why are these things in there? Why did Plato put them together in, in a solid whole um, rather than, so to speak, proof texting and just taking out, well, this is the section that I, that somebody thought was the important section. Um, but I'll admit that there was a, you know, it, it's always, there's always going to be a selective process. You know, you're never going to be able to present all of philosophy in an introductory course. So, you know, uh, you're always going to be at extracting. I just like to do it with whole works. Uh, it's a personal peculiarity, and you're welcome to have your own personal peculiarities. But <clears throat> whatever those are, uh, you know, I think it's fine to have a little bit of that spelled out in writing, you know, maybe a paragraph worth 
of that as part of the course description. So you're describing the course as it's described by the institution in the course catalog, and then you're describing, you know, sort of, this is how I do it. However that is, you know. Um, and I have seen philosophy presented in a tremendous diversity of methods. So, I mean, uh, or at any rate, by a tremendous diversity of personalities through time. Uh, the next point that uh, b beyond the course description uh, can vary a little bit, and I'll come back to that in the next session.